So, um, some of you may have studied Newman, you may have studied the essay in aid of a grammar of ascent, which is one of his final works, his final major work, and one of the most interesting of his works. Uh, but just to pick up a couple of things in that work, which I think are relevant to what we've been thinking about in regard to formation, human and spiritual, and Aquinas's anthropology. Uh, first paragraph for Aristotle, as we know, the human being is specified as the rational animal in Aristotelian logic, the way of specifying um, a, a, a group of creatures within the animal genus is to pick out the specific difference. What is it that marks this animal off from all the other animals? So you're not saying everything about that animal when you define it in Aristotelian logic. You're simply pointing to the thing that that marks it out from all the others, gives it this specific character. Newman writes, man is not a reasoning animal. Well, I'm sure he didn't mean that literally, but he wants to say he is a seeing, feeling, contemplating, acting animal, which is what Aquinas says as well, no? Um, so one kind of definition is where you're picking out that thing which is characteristic of us, Another kind of definition is where you try to give a comprehensive uh, definition, a comp well that's, that's a contradiction, <laughs> a comprehensive uh, account or description of a, cr of a creature. Um, so it's just I've always been taken by that, that comment of Newman, man is not a reasoning animal, he is a seeing, feeling, contemplating, acting animal. We can add social, interrelational, <laughs> uh, um, animal, linguistic, you could o add other things to that which you feel are important for talking about the fullness of, of, of what it means to be human. Uh, in the essay, uh, Grammar of Ascent, uh, the key idea is, I, I don't know if you're familiar with these, um, one is a distinction between what he calls notional and real apprehension and ascent. Another is a hypothesis of what he calls an illative sense. It's his own word. I think it's a form of phronesis or prudentia for Aquinas, prudence, the virtue of prudence in Aristotle, prudentia in Aquinas, the illative sense. For, for Newman, it's a sense, he says, we have, which enables us in many areas of life to, to move from uh, the point of seeing converging probabilities to a point of conviction about something, of making that kind of movement across the final, the final gap, if you like, where we're not going to get absolutely com uh, convincing evidence or argument for the direction of our thought, but we know we have enough probability to know that that's, that's what must be the case. Uh, that's the illative sense for Newman. But if you look at it, uh, it seems to me it's a, it's a form of prudence, it's a development, and he's very much influenced by Aristotle, Newman. So it will be interesting for somebody to do a study of Aquinas and Newman as Aristotelians. That will be an interesting project to see what Aristotle did Thomas know, what Aristotle did Newman know, and what are the, the points of connection. And the third point, of course, uh, the centrality of conscience. Um, there, but I just want to talk about the, this idea of notional and real apprehension and assent, and to suggest that maybe we can think about maturity, maturing, as being the the, the moving from notional apprehension and assent to real apprehension and assent. In other words, of entering more completely into our convictions and commitments. Uh, which maybe, as we begin, have something more of the notional about them, but as we go through life, should have something more of the real about them. Uh, our, our knowledge of God is, a, is the top example, of course. Uh, how are, it, you know, are we serious when we say that we can enter more deeply each day into a, a, a knowledge of God from a notional understanding, which is not uh, false, it's not d uh, dishonest or hypocritical, it's a real apprehension, not 
forget the word real there. <laughs> it's a true apprehension and assent for Newman, but it's distinct from a real apprehension and assent, which is one which is fully human, full of energy, and leads to action. So it's not just assenting in a, st in a classroom to the proposition that there is a God. We can all assent <coughs> easily to the proposition that there is a God. So what, you might say? So what, what happens next in your life from assenting to that proposition? And Newman's point is that very often our assent is, um, is notional. Not hypocritical, not false, not uh, deceptive, but it's not, think about my, when we pray for the poor, or when we talk about the gospel being for the poor, a lot of my assent, to, to be honest, a lot of my assent is, is notional to that. What do I do for the poor of St. Louis while I'm here? Do I do anything real <laughs> for the poor? I, I'm concerned about the poor. I wish that they were helped and so on. That's another example, perhaps. Uh, but you'll see as you look at these texts, for Newman, a real assent to something is not just intellectual. It's, uh, it's, it engages the imagination and the heart and it leads to action. That, that's what he wants to say. So, um, Another point in the second paragraph there, for Newman, faith is a kind of knowing that's not unique to religion. I think this is a very important point. One of the things we, we're up against I in contemporary culture is an understanding around the place that faith is only in the area of religion and that faith is the contrary of reason. These are two kind of first principles in secular culture, that faith is only something we do in religious, in the area of religion, and that faith is the opposite of reason. And they're both false. Most of my knowledge is, on a faith, is a faith knowledge. 95% of what I can say I know in geography and history and literature and uh, politics and science and mathematics and is a, is a knowledge I have by faith. I accept from experts, people I judge to be worthy witnesses and expert in those areas, what they tell me. So I'm believing most of what I know. Um, that's one point. The other point that's, that's, that's wrong is, is this setting up faith and reason as op opposed to each other. Um, because you know, to accept something on faith, um, because evidence is, is, is sufficiently strong in that direction, or because you have the testimony of a reliable witness, is not irrational. It's actually rational <laughs> to do that. It's reasonable to do that. And human life couldn't, couldn't function, couldn't proceed from day to day if we weren't acting in that way. So. So that's, that's a very important part of this work as well. Many aspects of our experience and understanding are subject to the distinction he makes between notional and real apprehension and assent. Many things to which we give only a notional assent and some to which we give real assent. Faith asks of us something like, he says, the kind of apprehension and assent we're accustomed to giving in relation to singulars. In other words, once only events, the kind of thing with which history is concerned. Thomas makes this distinction too uh, between a kind of speculative knowledge and the kind of certainty that comes with speculative knowledge and uh, the, the knowledge we can have of moral questions and the kind of certainty which can be attached to that. And they're not the same kind of certainty. He says that don't expect the same kind of certainty in questions of practical knowledge um, as you can have in questions of speculative knowledge. So it's, it's a similar point uh, in different terms, in different language. Aristotle uh, in the Metaphysics says, um, at one point he says, here's the greatest difficulty, aporia in Greek, aporia, aporetic. Uh, here's the greatest difficulty, says Aristotle, how to explain intellectual knowledge of individual things. 
and it, it's interesting because what, what it means in the end is that God has an intellectual knowledge of individual things. We don't have an intellectual knowledge of individual things. We have an intellectual knowledge of, of things in general, of universe, we universalize. If I'm to know an individual, I need my senses. I know individuals through sensation. God has no body, so he doesn't have seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling and touching. But because he's the creator of all things and gives the act of, of, of existence to everything that is, he knows individuals intellectually. It's interesting. Sometimes we might be tempted to think that God's knowledge is, is more removed, uh, higher. We might think that's higher than ours. But in fact, God has a, a deeper knowledge uh, of individual things than we have. Um, so how do we how do we cope with once-off things? That's what Newman is saying as well. That faith is about one unique things, not about general things. It's about unique things in history, events, persons. Um, how how can we have that kind of uh, conviction about such things? Um, scientific knowledge, as we use it normally. Uh, is something with which we're much more comfortable. It's what we're equipped best to know. A, a universal knowledge of this world. That's where our minds are most comfortable, which is why people are happier with science, because that's, that's our level. Not just um, experiencing the world, but coming to a reflective, abstract, universal um, understanding of our world. But once we move away from that, our minds are in trouble. They're, they begin to suffer. Because <laughs> we're trying to do things with our minds which are for which they're not uh, best equipped. OK. So then I got apprehension and assent. OK. Apprehension, new man, an intelligent acceptance of the idea or the fact which a proposition enunciates. Real apprehension expresses things external to us. It moves to the truth of those things. Notional apprehension expresses our own thoughts. It gets as far as my conviction about the truth of things. Maybe we could put it that way. Real apprehension is about experience, about the singular individual things experienced, remembered, recomposed. What is seen is best remembered or feelings experienced personally. It's about images rather than notions. Notional apprehension is about abstraction, about what's common. Our mind compares and contrasts, forms notions from images, generals from particulars. Language of this kind is inadequate, dealing with aspects, classifications, definitions, giving us a heap of notions rather than the fullness of meaning accruing to language from experience. So we end up with a heap of notions rather than the fullness of meaning. Sometimes when brothers in the past you know, have criticized our intellectual formation, it's because they feel they've ended up with a heap of notions rather than the fullness of meaning, no? When you hear people who, you know, maybe uh, you know, the, the work wasn't done well, or the initiation into, into Thomas particularly wasn't done well, people say, oh, a heap of notions rather than a fullness of meaning. Thomas runs that risk, Thomas Aquinas, because of the form in which his thought is presented, is one thing. It's a strange way of presenting your thought to us. It seems like a kind of mathematics. Uh, and many people in presenting Thomas's, Aquin Thomas's thought can kill it, can take the life out of it. And some forms of neo-scholasticism, neo-Thomism, and so on, are are rather dead. I'm sure they're accurate, and they're faithful to what's found in the text of Aquinas, but the life seems to go out of it, and you turn to Shakespeare <laughs> instead of Aquinas. Uh, so the challenge is to find the life in in Aquinas's thought, and um, so that it, it it's you know, what he's dealing with and wanting to communicate to us is a fullness of meaning about the human being, about God, about salvation, not 
a heap of notions. So that's a challenge. And in preaching as well, not just in teaching Aquinas, but in preaching the gospel, uh, to, to get to that, that point of um, <coughs> you know, speaking to people's experience from your experience um, of the faith and of, of living the gospel. Ascent then, apprehension is one thing, uh, receiving the world, coming to convictions about how things are. Ascent is my, my act of conviction about that, committing myself to that, saying yes, this is what I believe. Newman says ascent is always absolute and unconditional, but its character is different depending on whether it's based on notional apprehension or real apprehension. So if, if I say, you know, there is a God, and at this point uh, my ascent to that is, is fairly notional, uh, as I say, it's, it's sincere, it's true, it's, it's not hypocritical, but it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not entering into me, into my life, into my actions, in the way it would if my ascent to that were were real. But assent is always absolute and, uh, and unconditional. Famously, Newman says, no, a thousand difficulties don't make a doubt, because doubt and assent are incompatible. Sometimes when we use the word doubt, what we mean is difficulty. When people say, I'm doubting my face, often they're not really doubting in the strict sense of the term. People are saying, I see difficulties with the faith, with understanding the faith. So it's an important distinction between a difficulty and a doubt. And a doubt is a very formal <laughs> uh, declaration, which is incompatible with assent. Um, so you can't um, believe in the one you love and doubt the one you love at the same time. No, either one or one or other is not can't be true. Um, they're not compatible um, because of the the disposition that they they imply. So notional assent is formal, asserts simply on authority. Well, that's what the church says. So that's n never the most satisfactory answer to a question. No, unless the person is is disposed in a particular way towards what the church says, but. Um, people want, want to enter into a reflection on a question um, not to be told too quickly um, that's what the church says so that's it um, we want to know why what, what are the, what's the reasoning what are the arguments what's the, what's the tradition about that where does it come from um, professes to understand without understanding is about principles and notions, asserts as probably true, does not necessarily affect conduct. Notional assent is broad but shallow, Newman says. My, if my assent to the faith is, is at this level of notional, uh, it's broad but it's shallow. Whereas real assent, he says, is practical, involves imagination, leads to action, is personal, affects conduct, involves conscience. It is deep but narrow. Deep but narrow. He warns us about some forms of real ascent. He says, real ascent produces prophets and saints, but it also produces lunatics and demagogues. So real ascent is not immediately <laughs> um, wonderful uh, it's it's a kind of a conviction which is which is you know like that look at the fist I've made already how would you like to meet that in the in the middle of the night <laughs> we want a real scent huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh it was a rhetorical question <laughs> that's a much better way to approach life isn't it um, <laughs> But you see what the real ascent gives you. It gives you Ian Paisley on the one side, and it gives you, um, you know, jo John Henry Newman on the other side. Two very different personalities. Maybe Ian Paisley is somebody you don't know. Okay, so he was a Protestant preacher in Northern Ireland. 
who had no doubt about what he believed and what needed to be done at any moment in time. So, um, okay, uh, for Newman, theology is something to which we give notional assent because it is scientific, whereas religion is something to which we give real assent because it is personal. I suppose Newman's coming out of the Romantic movement as well. In the 19th century, a reaction to the rationalism of the Enlightenment period uh, affected by the Romantic movement. Um, and, and you can see some of this in his, in his concerns with imagination, for example, with the heart, with, with things finding their way to conduct. Thomas Aquinas has sometimes, well, he suffers always, I suppose, at our hands because every generation is using him in the way it wants to use him. So in that period, the presentation of Aquinas became very rationalistic in order to, 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 uh, to enable Thomism to stand in, in argument with the contemporary philosophies. But the contemporary philosophies were rationalistic. So Thomas begins to be presented in a rationalistic way. In the 20th century, many people became unhappy with this, said this is not satisfactory, this is not, this is not speaking to people's experience, this is uh, abstract, uh, a bundle of notions. Um, so, so people recover Aquinas' uh, scripture commentaries, for example, or Aquinas' prayers, Thomas Paul Murray's book on Aquinas' prayers. So there's been a kind of a recovery of, of a bigger Thomas than, than was around previously. Um, and, and maybe Newman is, is, you know, is articulating something of this uh, dissatisfaction with a theology which is scientific, but which you know, doesn't, doesn't touch the heart, doesn't, doesn't affect conduct, doesn't really set people on fire and uh, a religious experience which, which does those things um, and which is more fully human because it's not just intellect, it's also heart and feeling and imagination and action. Okay, so uh, this quote from Newman towards the end of the page, there is a God, the proposition, there is a God, when really apprehended, is the object of a strong energetic adhesion which works a revolution in the mind. If you really apprehend there is a God, the reality of that proposition, of the truth which is articulated in that proposition, would work a revolution in the mind. But when it is held merely as a notion, it requires but a cold and ineffective acceptance, though it be held ever so unconditionally. So you might say, of course, we all know that there is God, that's taken for granted, and then we go on to talk about something else. So it hasn't had any, any impact on the... Such in its character uh, is the ascent of thousands, he says, whose imaginations are not at all kindled, nor their hearts inflamed, nor their conduct affected by the most august of all conceivable truths. So there he tells you what he wants, what he's looking for, it is an apprehension of religious truths and an assent to religious truths, which is not just an intellectual acceptance of its truth, but which kindles the imagination, inflames the heart, and affects the conduct. Then you have a real assent to religious truth. Um, so I just thought it'd be helpful to, to, to share the point you towards Newman anyway, because he's, a, I think, is a very extraordinary Christian thinker. Um, and also because I think it, you know, there are these connections with the way I was presenting Aquinas' anthropology yesterday. Um, and, you know, uh, as a way of thinking about our own human and spiritual maturing. I add on at the end a quote I found from Certilange, the French Dominican, uh, early 20th century, um, the generation before Chenu and Congar and all of these more famous names, but there were some very significant French Dominican theologians in the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, 
Certilange among them. St. Thomas, he said, would have been the first to admit, indeed he laid down the rules, that besides the teaching by concepts and dogmatic propositions, there is the teaching by imagery and the appeal to the emotions to which are due the final triumph of truth in the world. So it's interesting, isn't it? It says that you teach concepts and propositions, but there's also a teaching which appeals to the imagination, and there's a teaching which appeals to the emotions. Uh, and it's those uh, powers in us, or that way of doing it, which leads to the final triumph of truth in the world. Okay, so that's, that's just too briefly. I mean, it'd be good to just spend a bit more time thinking about that, but um, in honour of Newman's canonization, I thought it would be good to, uh, to acknowledge him. Have you done anything on Newman? Any of you? No? No. I, I would, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that people would keep studying Newman. Um, We're actually going to have a, a few days after the semester is in, and we're going to have someone come in and talk to us about mm. our use Newman's habit of homily. Oh, okay, so excellent. So yeah. Reflection mm. for the season, so yeah, no, he's, he's great, um, one of the great preachers of the. Scott's huh? on top of it for us. Mm? <laughs> He's one of the great preachers of the 19th century. I mean, it was uh, so the last period in history, I suppose, when pulpit preaching was was a kind of a, um, I was going to say a spectator sport, but it was, <laughs> it was almost, you know, w attracted crowds. If you think of Lacordaire preaching in Notre Dame in Paris and the city kind of everybody looking for a ticket and Newman preaching in, in Oxford on a Sunday afternoon and everybody wanting to get in a small church but uh, I mean you can't imagine well it could happen if, if a great preacher comes to town Bishop Barron maybe has that kind of appeal or Jean Vanier had that kind of appeal for example um, um, but, but Newman's sermons and of course at that time I mean to, they would preach for, for a good hour or something you know the, um, um, they're wonderful texts the, the sermons of Newman yeah. This is on what you said about uh, Thomas and the notional and yeah. So um, so you you said that every generation uses Thomas in the way they want to use him as far as like a drawback in that. And my question was, is this wholly true for people who are giving real assent to Thomas, encountering the person, the vibrant thinker, rather than the repository of thoughts? I've had some teachers who have brought Thomas alive. You know, when we talk about bringing somebody something alive. Um, I've had other teachers who <laughs> brought brought Thomas to the cemetery. Um, you know, or who, who kind of now they're both they're both faithful to the text. You know, they're they're, they're both using the same text, but one person's understanding apprehension of Thomas was real. In other words, that they saw they saw the implications of those texts, what it, those arguments, those positions for human life, for human life and experience. The other, person, the other person's apprehension was more notional, so still accurate, but not, not kind of m m like presenting a, a, a structure of thought or a philosophy rather than a way of, of living. Um, I don't know, does that, does that make the point that um, I think in every generation there will be people who will have that kind of ap appreciati appreciation of Aquinas, mm -hmm. even though each generation has its, own, um, has its own concerns and preoccupations and therefore will turn to Thomas yeah. you know, in order to, to help them with those contemporary preoccupations and concerns. Yeah, it, it, like it seemed to me, and you talking about this, it gave like a vocabulary to what it means to bring Thomas alive. Yeah. And that he's, uh, like that he's a living, like that he's a living mind 
for the mind that knows the structure yeah. Yeah. and outline of his thought. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's a living mind that contemporary living minds would be impressed by, engaged by, intrigued by all these things. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the notional and the real as a language for that, I had not heard before. Yes, I think, uh, I think there's two ways in which Newman's language can be applied to our study of Thomas. One would be to explore whether his distinction between notional and real connects with a distinction which goes back to Aristotle between speculative and practical knowledge. Okay, so notional is speculative and real is practical. And Thomas continues with that distinction uh, in his work. The second way in which you could come is to say, in our, in our reading of Thomas Aquinas and our use of his texts and his thought today, uh, are we doing it notionally? Are we treating him um, as if that's what he is? Uh, what's the phrase? Uh, a bundle of, uh, what is it? A bundle of notions. Um, rather than a, a living person, a, a thinker. <laughs> you know, are we interested in Aquinas as a thinker? Or are we just interested in the texts that, that he produced? Um, so you, you, you'd be trying to get at his way of thinking. Um, we don't, we, somebody said in one of the conversations over the weekend, we were talking about Albert the Great and Thomas Aquinas, and Albert seems to come through in his writings as a personality more than Thomas. Um, so you kind of feel you get to know a little bit about what Albert the Great might have been like as a, as a, as a brother. Whereas with Thomas, um, it's almost part of his genius that he disappears into his thought, you know, and it's just this lucid, clear, um, calm, reflect reflective, meditative, dialogical presentation of, of, uh, of arguments. But, but I think there's a fire burning in Thomas Aquinas as well. <laughs> you know, that's what we've tried to get at. Um, and, and sometimes if we ideologize him, you know, if we turn his thought into a, a system in the wrong kind of a way, maybe we block access to, to him as a, as a human being. Uh, who, you know, it's Jesus we're wanting to make known to people, isn't it, in the first place? Not Thomas Aquinas or Dominic or Ignatius Loyola or John Henry Newman or Catherine Lopsey or anybody else. Um, and Thomas as a servant of the gospel, you know, making his remarkable contribution at his time, um, which is still of great value, I think of great value for us, of great use to us, but of, of use to us if we, if, we, if we accompany him in the work, not if we turn his work into a, a sort of a, a, a philosophy or a philosophical system. I don't know, other people will disagree with that maybe. One of our teachers in the Irish province used to say, if you meet a man who calls himself a Thomist, you can be sure he's not, which might sound a bit too clever. If you meet a man who calls himself a Thomist, you can be sure he's not. So what, was he, what point was he trying to make that, you know, Thomas Aquinas is not the founder of a school. He didn't imagine himself as the founder of a school or a political party or a philosophical uh, school um, or, or, or you know. so, so um, I mean I'm, I'm saying those things now in, in response to your question because they would be different ways in which we would make Thomas unreal you know and I'm all for studying Thomas Aquinas I think it's you know, it's one of the best things a Dominican can do after praying and reading the Bible. <laughs> the next best thing he could do is study Thomas Aquinas. But to do it in a way that, that, that brings him, al you know, brings his thought alive. I was wondering if for Newman you need a notional apprehension in order to arrive at 
a great real apprehension. Because one of the things I'm thinking about is how Thomas and Aristotle talk about wisdom as knowing lower things and more particular things through your knowledge of higher things. So I'm wondering, is there something like that with Newman and this distinction? Yes, that a, a real ascent will include a notional ascent, but it goes beyond it. So it's not that you put imagination and emotion in the place of intellect, but that you add to intellect emotion and imagination. So it becomes a more fully human understanding rather than simply a, a scientific or intellectual one. Yeah. Yes, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not kind of passion at the at the, at the price of, of intellect, but but something which is more more comprehensive. Yep. I was wondering how we can map on map this distinction of uh, notional and real apprehension onto the previous discussion of. Um, maturity and immaturity, happiness, um, sort of adulthood and formation, uh, just if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah. So that, was, that was one of my questions as well, and I was wondering, you know, what I, I, is there, I, I can't think immediately offhand whether in the grammar of ascent or elsewhere Newman, Newman tells us how to get from one to the other, mm -hmm. because if you want to, to use them to map uh, what we've been talking about, maturing in understanding, maturing as a human being, maturing in our spiritual life, it would seem that you want to make the move from notional to real, uh, accepting that you know the notion is always included within the real. So is, is this your question as well? Is it, it, does Newman tell us how to do that? Um, and I can't, I, I don't have a copy of the, the Grammar of Ascent with me now, but um, it would be an interesting question with which to go to Newman and say, what, you know, what's the, what's the, what's the, the journey? What, how does he see? And I imagine he would begin to talk about you know, participation in the church's life, uh, in the sacramental life of the church, uh, reading the fathers of the church and the great theologians, of course, meditating on the scriptures. Do you know that it would be, the answer would be along those lines that it's, uh, um, his own apologia, you know, to read the apologia pro vita sua, his, his defense of his life um, gives you, it's like Augustine's confessions, you know, and you can see here's this man's, here's this man's personal journey uh, and, and, you know, so he's, he's reading and thinking and praying. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I was thinking about our discussion of uh, sort of friendship and maturity and co community life. And is there a way? Is there a way that sort of moving from notional to real apprehension sort of can be of persons? Like um, you sort of you get to you know sort of barriers come down. You know you sort of become more authentically yourself. You can relate to more people and relate to brothers more as brothers than as sort of a person who has these set of qualities, or more as a sort of an individual. Yes, I think that's that's that's. Uh, um, that's at the heart of, of common, common life. You know, when I arrive here and I meet 12 or 15 students, um, my first, I was thinking about this, um, my first, you know, I see similarities between brothers here and their particular interests and preoccupations and brothers in other studentettes that I've, that I've met. And I sort of, it's almost like my first, my first experience is, is, is at this level of, of kind of universals. So I say, oh, well, Brother uh, Aaron or Jesse, who were we talking <laughs> about yesterday? <laughs> Brother Aaron is, a, well, I know that kind of student. I've met them before in, in, in Brazil and in South Africa. And Brother Jesse, yeah, I've met his kind as well, you know. So, so I'm not yet knowing the individual brothers. So, but as the weeks go by, uh, I'm beginning to to get to know the individual brothers as individual brothers, not as, uh, not as examples of a particular kind of student or a particular kind of uh, concern or preoccupation. You know, so there's, there's that movement in my, in my knowledge of the brothers I've been living with these past few weeks, uh, which is becoming more real 
Yeah. Now, nobody has come at me with a fist yeah. yet, like a bit, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but is that is that what you mean? Yeah, that uh, yeah, yeah. so and th that's that's why that point Aristotle makes is very interesting. About here's the great difficulty, says of the, this intellectual knowledge of the individual thing, um, because f in order to have a knowledge of an individual person, we have to we have to live with them. And 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 get you know in through shared experience get to know them. Otherwise, uh, I I can know them, notionally. I might even have met them, and but my, my knowledge of my knowledge of them is not very deep. So I classify them. That's what the intellect does. It classifies, um, and it's very useful. It means you can build buildings and run electricity and do science. And so classification is not to be. Snee sneeze that, but uh, in human relations, it's it's it only takes you to n not very far, really, in your knowledge of other people. So I think that's a good a good yeah, good analogy, a good connection. Um, well, I had a similar question. I had a similar question in regards to. Um, you've been given this privilege of having a worldview, um, and so you've met brothers who really have digested, and not only do they know Aquinas, but they're able to present him in such a way that's captivating. I mean, I think several of us have talked about these Dominicans in our own formation houses uh, in Oakland, D.C., and here in St. Louis. And so I'm curious if you could, you could if you wouldn't mind listing, what are some of these universal qualities that you see those men have? Um, like what do they have that, that you think really does allow them to have this captivating presentation of, a Tom, of Thomas in a real, real apprehension sense? And, and, it, and it draws others to the intellectual life of the order. That's a deep question. Um, I'm just thinking of, yes, the, the people I would kind of value, have valued most as teachers of Aquinas um, I mean, I think there are people who who go to school with Aquinas, and and do 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 theology in the way he did it. That's that's the first thing. Their their focus is not Aquinas. Their focus is Christ <laughs> and the gospel and the preaching of the gospel. So it's not that they they want to set up a kind of you know within the church a sort of a sort of a subculture which is Thomistic or something like that. The, 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 the focus is Christ and the gospel and the preaching of the gospel. Um, then there are men and women, men and women, because there are quite a few Dominican sisters now who are also very good, it seems to me, in, in reading and um, in their approach to Aquinas, then they'll be, they'll be following the same methodology, which means not just reading Aquinas, but reading the Bible, of course, reading the fathers of the church, you know, becoming familiar with the Christian tradition, looking sideways as well to what's going on in the intellectual life of the world in which they find themselves. What are the philosophers saying? What are the scientists saying? You know, that's the methodology of Aquinas, no? And then as a saint, as in his spiritual uh, personality, uh, having this kind of calm, that's a great word for Aquinas, I think. Calm. There are very few passages in Aquinas where he gets very excited, um, negative, in a negative sense. He rarely dismisses people or their opinions. He never dismisses people. He rarely even dismisses opinions as uh, stupid or, you know, there are one or two famous places where he does, but they're famous because they are so few. Uh, so his approach is always, you know, he has uh, this calm confidence that the truth is, is God. <laughs> uh, it's not mine. It's not something I have to, you know, defend in, in a kind of defensive kind of way. Um, it's, it's the truth, and it's for everybody, and we're its servants. And so we can be, we can be uh, courageous and we can be uh, humble at the same time. 
in our service of the truth. That's, that, that's what I see in the, the sanctity. If you talk about in what way is Thomas Aquinas holy, um, that's where I would see it, is, is that kind of sense of, as he says somewhere, the truth is strong in itself and nothing can prevail against it. Uh, it's an objective reality. So it's something that we're invited to, to find and to, to enjoy. Um, so that gives him a particular approach to study and to de presenting arguments and to listening to other people's arguments and to kind of sifting, you know, sifting and purging not just your heart's purposes but the arguments that are presented in, in theology and philosophy. I don't know, is that, is that some kind of an answer to the... Um, so the, the people I think I found most valuable are people who've been able to do that, as, uh, you know, the best. So not just people who know the text best and are able to tell you where to find different things, but people who seem to have, you know, taken on the style of Aquinas um, in their way of, of uh, teaching and preaching. And There were two, two great teachers in, in Tala, in that Irish Dominican House of Studies. Before my time, there were two, you know, renowned teachers of, of Aquinas. And one was described as a gazelle, and the other was described as a mountain goat. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the gazelle uh, was Father William Barden, who was a wonderful man. Um, he became Archbishop of Isfahan of the Latins he was in, in Iran. He was the Latin Rite Archbishop in Iran. But William died about, he was 96, I think, when he died. William was the gazelle, and he, uh, they say he jumped through the Summa, you know, <laughs> uh, and the works of Aquinas, and, and stopped at all the, all the rich pasture lands and, and flower beds of, of Aquinas. The other man was Cornelius Williams, whom I, I met once or twice, but spent most of his life in Fribourg. And he was a very different personality. And he worked through the summer down one valley, across the valley floor, up the mountainside, over the mountain, down the, down the mountain, across the valley, up the valley. <laughs> so <laughs> there are two different ways of, uh, of feeding, feeding on Aquinas. Um, and who's to say, I mean, the boats, the boats, valuable, I can't make a judgment about. Um, people used to say about William, uh, somebody said, he's very holy, isn't he? To which uh, one of the others said, uh, I don't think so, I think he was born like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've let the time run on because uh, there, there won't be, you know, there won't be time to, I, I'll give you the other two handouts, um, which are simply, it, it was simply, you know, going back to the Ratio Formationis Generalis and looking at the section on the process of integration into the Dominican life and the context of formation in Dominican life and sort of picking out, which I've done in bold, uh, you know, the aspects of, of, of our, your formation now um, which, which, looking at the, looking at it again. That's where we began on Friday night. So looking at it again after after yesterday and, and this morning, you know, sort of trying to point out well in the in the in a, in a a human and spiritual formation being offered today by your provinces to younger Dominican brothers. Um, here are the ways in which, in practice, we try to. Uh, help you to to mature spiritually and humanly. So so when you get to a ratio, you're get you're getting to something a bit more concrete. It should be saying here are the things to be done in each province in order to uh, help you know help the brothers to mature humanly to mature spiritually. So uh, so it, it it it's more concrete. So I'll just pass them around and. Uh, if you're inclined to, whoops, to look at them sometime, obviously you can do that.
So there are two handouts. One is uh, paragraphs 33 to 46, and the other is 47 to 56. Let me draw your attention very quickly to, to points that I think are, are quite important. Um, paragraphs 35 to 38 are about different kinds of suffering that you will encounter in the, in, the, in the course of your formation and the ways in which formators should be accompanying brothers through experiences of loss, disappointment, suffering, uh, the tedium of formation, it, you know, there's a certain kind of courage that's needed to, to keep going after three years, after four years, after five years, after six years, um, and so on. Number 39 is important. The basic human maturity is essential in those who are given responsibilities for formation as well as those assigned to communities of formation not just as role models, but to sh make sure that you have brothers who won't feel they need to exploit the students in any way. There are various ways in which senior brothers can exploit junior brothers. And not just senior brothers who are priests already, but sometimes senior brothers in within studentettes. Um, there are various kinds of, of exploitation. Uh, the general chapter this time, for the first time, has a section on um, you know, responding to sexual, uh, what was the phrase, sexual, not molestation, or sexual approaches or advances, uh, if, if brothers in formation experience sexual approaches by other brothers, especially by senior brothers. Um, and that's a sign of the times that a general chapter would feel it necessary to talk about such a thing. But the point I want to make for the moment is that's not the only way in which people can, can exploit other people. No, uh, There are other ways in which um, that can happen. So maturity is asked uh, of, of those who are formators uh, as well as those who are assigned to communities of formation to try to uh, ensure that this doesn't happen. Number 40, I don't know what you think about this because it's a bit judgmental about your generation. Um, formators must work against a common tendency, especially in the years of initial formation, to infantilize brothers. I would say brothers themselves need to think about whether or not they want to allow themselves to be infantilized or they want to return to a situation of some kind of dependence, which wouldn't be possible if you were still out in the big bad world, but which can be possible in this kind of a context. Um, the judgment is this. On the other hand, there's the contemporary phenomenon of an extended adolescence, along with a culture of dependence and entitlement in the younger generations. Now, you might disagree with that, but that's, uh, that's an evaluation that uh, is sometimes made of the millennial generation, no? Um, this presents new t challenges for formation, particularly in regard to community life poverty and obedience. Um, 42 is about a very important part of our maturing is to, to begin to learn how to do Dominican government. <coughs> We're all involved in Dominican government because our government is chapter based. So every brother is permanently involved <coughs> in Dominican government. It's not just the brothers who are elected superiors who have that uh, involvement. Everybody has to carry responsibility for and, you, and that formation in that is from the beginning, should be from the beginning. That's in the constitutions, no? That there are chapters already in the novitiate and, and in the studentate and participation in community meetings. Uh, 43 is about friendship. We talked a little bit about that. 44 can be very significant, in more significant in some parts of the world than in others. What kind of relationship you have with your family once you join the order? It's an issue everywhere, but in Africa, for example, it's a very particular issue because of the bonds, family bonds in African cultures. And it's, it's not immediately automatic that making solemn profession in a religious congregation within an African culture 
is understood as counting as a, you know against the very deep cultural bond with the family and obligations to the family so um so that may you know you might say what's that doing there um coming from some cultures brothers joined the order who've already become autonomous you know who've already left their families and obviously are still in relationship with them but are not in any relationship of of dependence or or obligation mm. um apart from the the obligations of of piety and charity and so on um but in in uh, some cultures there are other obligations that people feel um towards families the last two are about Dominican family and the church. So your formation is happening or should be happening in a bigger context always. You know, that you're not just a little isolated community, but you have connections and, and relationships with the Dominican family and with the, the wider church. In the other section, uh, the context of formation, um, what's to be noted particularly there, um, adapting to differences in culture, in experience. Um, number 49, initiation into Dominican life ought to take place in a convent. That might seem obvious, but one of my concerns in the recent years has been that there are quite a few houses of formation which are not actually formally erected as convents. Now you might say, what's the big deal about that? Well, the big deal about that is there might be very good brothers there, two or three senior brothers with the novices, or two or three senior brothers with the students. Uh, it's not a convent. Uh, it means that some aspects of Dominican life and spirituality are not possible in that place. So superiors are not elected, for example. That's one, one thing that will be missing. Um, so the student brothers are not seeing our life in its fullness. There are not enough brothers to be voting on brothers for profession. If there are only two or three brothers in a community, it doesn't seem as just as if there are 14 or 16 brothers voting on brothers for profession. Or in Washington, how many brothers would vote on brothers for profession? 25, 25 or 30, yes. So, um, but to have just two or three, you know, you, you know, human relations being what they are, there's the greater potential for, for injustice, no? In a, in a, in a, if there are just two or three. Um, so that's, what, that's a concern as well, if, if, the convent, if the community of formation is not a, a priory in the strict sense. OK, um, men who are older, joining the Order 51, coming from seminaries, priests already, you know, there are special circumstances that need to be responded to and taken on board. Um, 52, if, if, if a, a man finds his vocation at the same time as he becomes a Catholic, or in the same experience in which he becomes a Catholic, or becomes a Catholic again, having been a Catholic and fallen away or something like that, that's all very well, very good, real ascent. On the other hand, it's important not to confuse the two realities. It's not the same thing to be converted or reconverted to the faith and to discern a vocation to a religious order. Um, so they need to be kept distinct and the person needs a good experience of ordinary church life just in case they think that um, you know, being a Catholic and being a Dominican are simply equivalent. Um, so. There was one, uh, Cornelius Ernst, I don't know if you know that name, Cornelius Ernst. He was a very remarkable English Dominican, in, well, S Sri Lankan Dutch, but came to study in England and joined the English province. He translated the first volume of uh, Rahner's Theological Investigations and was the teacher of, you know, the teacher of Timothy Radcliffe, the teacher of Fergus Kerr, the teacher of many, many of the people you know. Um, Cornelius Ernst, he died, he was only 50, 52 or something, very, very young. Um, why am I talking about him? Oh yes, he became a Catholic in order to become a Dominican. <coughs> he wanted to, he met the Dominicans in, uh, in Oxford and said, oh, I would like to be that. And then somebody said to him, you know, you, you need to be a Catholic 
in order to become a Dominican. Oh, well, I've become a Catholic <laughs> to become a Dominican. So, um, so sometimes it works very well if a person finds the faith and their vocation at the same time. 53, social economic issues. Joining the order gives you a higher standard of living than you would have had if you didn't join the order. What are you going to do about that? What are you going to think about that? Joining the order gives you a status in the society which you wouldn't have if you hadn't joined the order, or becoming a priest gives you a status. So these are all important things to think about. And formators working with brothers in formation you know, need to be working on motivation. You know, what's the, I would say, why did you join? Why are you staying? Why are you not leaving is a good question. Your question to add to that. Um, I, I'm going to spend a few days thinking about those questions myself next week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, why did I join? Why did I stay? Why did I not leave? Um, sifting and purging our heart's purposes. Questions about sexuality, sexual orientation, human intimacy, attitudes to women and men. There can be significant cultural differences across uh, the different countries in which the order is working about such matters. So in some cultures you can be very straightforward and direct in talking about sexual matters, for example. In other cultures there, sti there would still be a sense of, of taboo, you know, a strong sense of taboo and that these are not things that ought to be talked about publicly. Now that presents its own set of questions especially when we're thinking about the, um, the abuse crisis as it developed, which it seems to me was significantly connected with uh, the fact of not having a language with which to speak about these things, or the fact of not having the, the possibility of speaking more <coughs> openly and not publicly in front of everybody, but publicly in the sense of Having a, having a, do you know what I mean? Having a, a more uh, usable discourse for talking about such questions. Um, but people were, you know, taboo means um, no. Uh, so you whisper in corners and you speak in code, and father suddenly disappears and it's his health, and uh, you know there were all these ways of of uh, of, of, of responding which today we see is not, not a, a satisfactory response. So we need to have a language. Um, but still, some parts of the order, it's not this general chapter now, there was a very long discussion about this question. And for people, I've only been at two, but some of them there have been at four, five, six. But they said that that discussion at, at Vietnam this summer would not have been possible nine years ago, 12 years ago, that even the order, you know, among ourselves have been on a, on a, a formation journey uh, in relation to the ability to talk as a whole group about the question of sexual abuse and even the, you know, the question of sexual uh, uh, advances within, within communities, you know, w w I think even six years ago that wouldn't have come onto the agenda. So, uh, so a need for sensitivity, you know, to, uh, in that, um, to sort of try to read, you know, people's people's capacity, uh, the way in which they want to talk about things, the way in which humour might be taken up, because uh, a sense of humour is one thing that is different from culture to culture as well, and uh, you know, something that you could easily say in a Dublin pub with the brethren <laughs> uh, may not carry in another, in another part of the world. It would be regarded as very offensive or uh, trivialising or, you know, so. Anyway, there are all those facts about us. Um, I think that's probably all. Uh, 55, sexuality, uh, learning to live chastely, obviously. But it's also about what I said yesterday, you know, life and life and communion. That's what our sexuality is about. Uh, being in communion with other people and sharing life, giving life. So um, 
the integration of the life into the life of the community, participating joyfully in its preaching mission, is the is the fulfilment of our sexuality. You could say, as as Dominican friars, uh, that's where we 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 fulfil our our eros, our erotic um, energy. Um, okay. And the last one then is about generational uh, conversation and collaboration, um, as inviting the older brothers to ensure that each generation of brothers is enabled to grow, to bring its gifts to the order, and gradually to share responsibility for the order, while also working to ensure that our traditions are passed on to the new generations. So that's the that's a, a you know another way of thinking about the that the task of formation is to the formators are on the front line in a sense of the of the provinces receiving new brothers so needing to be open to what the new brothers are bringing but at the same time being giving some kind of lead in sharing with the new brothers the traditions of the order and the province that that you've joined so okay so i, I thought those two sections particularly of the ratio are the ones where you know at that level, we try to make concrete the ways in which human and spiritual maturity is to be uh, helped along. Obviously, the Ratio Studiorum Generalis and Particularis is focused on the academic and pastoral training. But this one, uh, the Formationis, is more on the human and spiritual formation.